Kate Spicer, welcome to the Great Big Book Club. It's a joy to have you on. Hi, Mo. You look fab. <laughs> so do you. How are you? I'm okay. I'm sorry my hair's not dry. Oh no, it's perfect. Have you just had a shower? I only have about one bath a week during lockdown. It's fantastic. <laughs> I'm so protecting thought... myself in my own probiotics. You look delightful. Um, could you... Obviously, you are the author, journalist of um, The Brilliant Lost Dog. Um, before we have a chat, uh, I wondered if you just might just give her a tiny flavour of um, how brilliant the book is. Yes, yes. So, here's the book. And I'm going to read you, just to give you a bit of context, I'm going to read you a bit. I'm at a wedding in the home counties. It's a pretty dreary wedding. And I've just discovered that my dog has gone missing. And uh, my boyfriend and I walk silently from the venue saying goodbye to nobody and get in the car. Still gulping and gasping silently, I do not cry, but my mouth is agape, wet with strings of saliva. It's now that somewhere in my mind, the phrase, he's just a dog, starts to appear like a stupid flashing sign in an ancient landscape of love and pain. Just a dog. Is an attempt to make the pain at losing my dog subside? A desperate relativizing mantra that also succeeds in humiliating my uncontrollable and real terrible fear and grief? Just a dog. I can hear the gravel on the drive crunching underfoot as we walk to the car. I didn't say goodbye, says Charlie. They'll understand. He has his arm round me. Can you drive, he asks. The bride's preference for cheap wine had not put him off drinking it. I kick off my wedding shoes, pushing my feet sockless into a pair of cold wellies. As I climb into the car, I imagine that we've brought him with us and his little sleeping form is coiled in the back, inside the old pink and white wool blanket one brow cocked in greeting as we return to the car. Swift pee and a poo round the car park and then we can drive home. As I start the engine and, and drive back the way we came a few hours earlier. <laughs> Hi Wolfie, do you not like this passage? Is it upsetting? Or is it that you're pretty pissed off I haven't fed you your supper yet? <laughs> um, okay. As I start the engine and drive back the way we came just a few hours earlier, I start to cry. Big, open-jawed, slobbery, salivary, bawling. Flashes of women in hijab keening over the corpses of children murdered by dictators jab at my consciousness. Just a dog. Just a dog. This is the most acutely terrifying thing that has ever happened to me. I drive hunched over the wheel calling both verbally and telepathically to my hound. Wolfie, Wolfie, please be okay. Meanwhile, the bitch chorus in my mind has its persistent descant refrain. Losing a dog is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You're pathetic, pathetic. Wolfie, I'm coming, Wolfie. <laughs> Sorry he interrupted that. That was gorgeous. You almost made me cry. Oh, oh gosh. Well, that was so cute. That was a huge success last year, and it's now out in paperback, which is why yes. we're talking. Yes. It's amazing. So, so Kate, so you, so it's just been such a huge success. You must have been amazed when it suddenly first took off. Um, well, I don't know about you as a writer, but I, once I've written something, Oh, sometimes you just cringe and think everything's rubbish, but you have that moment of going, okay, I did, did an all right job there. And then you're just like, shit, what am I going to do next to make money? So I'd kind of forgotten it and put it behind me. Um, and so when it, yeah, when, when it actually did make the Sunday Times bestseller list, I was, uh, yeah, really surprised. But it's, it's, a, it's your story, but slightly I mean, how much, how much is it at, what, what, can you just explain what the story is for, for people who actually haven't read the book? Or yeah, so, um, so I, so Lost Dog is, when I, when I first thought about writing this book, I just kept thinking, oh, who, 
gives a shit about you? Who cares? Who cares about you losing a dog? And I kept sort of trying to write it and, it, and I just kept thinking, oh, this is dull, this is dull, this is dull. And then I suddenly realised it needed the context of who Wolfie had saved and why my losing my dog was such a trauma. So the first part of the book is called Lost Woman. And that's me. It, the, the first chapter is me in a flat in Mayfair taking loads of drugs with idiots. Um, and then from there, I get the dog and you see how the dog <coughs> saves me. Sorry, that's what we're coughing. Chamon. Chamon, chien. So you see him kind of saving me and our lives kind of harmonizing and me going around my life in the real Notting Hill, not the working title version of it. Uh, and me just falling deeply in love with him because it is a love story. It is called Lost Dog, a love story. And then um, the second part of the book does what it says on the box and it's Lost Dog and it's about me going to that wedding and Wolfie running away from my brother's house and my kind of mad nine days trying to find him. Um, and I don't want to spoil the ending. There is every chance that I'd had him cloned from a bit of dog poo or something uh, and he never came back. So, you know, I don't want to spoil the ending for anyone. But yeah, so the second half of the book is my sort of trudges around London and, and, and the battles with my brother who lost my dog. Yes, well, that's why I like that. Yes, yes. Complex relationship, you know, yes. some, some really serious family problems could have... It was just before Christmas as well, and I just there was always a little part of me that thought, "Shit, Christmas is gonna be terrible this year." Um, but it yeah, is. You needed the context of my me being a mess to understand why it was so significant when you ran away. But having said that, I've obviously spoken to loads and loads of people who've lost dogs over the years now, uh, including some quite famous people, and everybody's devastated. You know, even the hardest, hardest kind of toughest, most cynical bloke. And you scratch the surface of asking them about their dog lost stories is reduced to tears. So I didn't, I don't think I needed to be a mess already. For, I don't think I needed for the dog to have saved me for me to have been heartbroken about him going. But everybody loves stories with drugs in anyway, don't they? So, well, that's true. And I was just wondering if we start right from that back from the beginning. So um, you are, are and were sort of, uh, um, sort of a very groovy lifestyle journalist mainly working for you know the standard the sunday times um i even got into the ft a few times <laughs> and um and i was sort of wondering whether the, the beginning is that the opening scene is is brilliant about uh, sitting up all night taking drugs and then you reaching naked for a bottle of mezcal on a, on the fridge yeah and I wondered whether that sort of, you know, the whole thing about being in the media, it was sort of, you know, drugs, media, parties, lifestyle, journalism, it, was, it seemed to be very endemic in that period in the uh, uh, in the, uh, 90s and... Um, yeah, well, I think the, the, the point about all of that, I mean, first of all, I, I never really hung out and done drugs with journalists. I've, I've heard that journalists are known to do drugs but I'd, I'm they're not really my social group and the people I did like a lot of my friends aren't, aren't into drugs or anything and the people I actually did drugs with were kind of my wrecker friends and um, I see a lot less of them interestingly now um, but I think what my story is about is someone way way past their sell-by date for that kind of behavior so you know, if you were talking to Peter Hitchens about my book, he would just think it was absolutely disgusting and that drug taking is just revolting. But actually, as most normal people know, uh, it's pretty endemic in our society and many other societies. And indeed, you could say throughout history. But you talk a lot about sort of that sort of low level addiction. Yeah, um, kind of um, Gen X thing. low level addiction, which... But low level addiction, you could call it use versus abuse. I know a lot of people who are very successful, um, who are low level users, they're not even, maybe not even addicts. Uh, I know, I'm not, I'm not particularly pro uh, prohibition really. I, I think it creates as many problems as it solves, but this isn't a conversation for here. 
But I think there has to come a point where you sort of zip that behavior up for your health, for your mental health, just so you can get a good night's sleep. And most of my particularly girlfriends had done that because they have what I call a partyectomy and they called pregnancy. Uh, and you, you clean up your act, you have other things going on. Like I didn't have, I didn't, ha I don't have kids. Um, I don't have loads of responsibilities. I live in a pretty small flat. I don't have huge outgoings. So I just carried on rolling around doing what I'd always done. So the little bit of Brett Easton Ellis in me was still, it was still alive. Whereas I think a lot for a lot of people, it's memories memories of that time you're talking about the 90s yeah know. i am I wrote, I wrote my book in 2018 i know but, but it is <laughs> 20 years later it was time to sort of stop it but there's a, a brilliant scene in your book uh right at the beginning where uh where you meet your friend who, who introduces you to the, the love of dogs uh and and the cafe and you end up slamming the door into uh by accident but into a woman uh who was, was it by accident Oh, I don't know. <laughs> that's what that I plan. say because I'm walking out of the coffee shop where I, it's kind of like if it was, uh, I guess, if it was a, um, if it was a movie, it, a lot of this film would take place in a coffee shop on Portobello Road called Coffee Plant. But I, um, yeah, I, I, there's this bit in the book where I walk out of Coffee Plant and there's this big heavy glass door, and there's a woman coming through with her daughter and she's really, really, really like this and everything the daughter does is a performance and I just want to get out. I'm hungover. I just want to get out of the fucking coffee shop and go home. But I've got to watch this sort of paternal performance worship, this sort of maternal worshipping performance happening in a bloody doorway. So I just walk through the door without holding it and the door slams in the child's face. And the mother goes apeshit, gets right up in my face going, you knew she was there. You knew she was there. Why didn't you hold the door? And I was like, oh, of course I didn't know she was there. And I'm, I would never have done that if I knew she was there. And, um, and, I, and I was like, and I presume that you'd hold the door for your own daughter? Just a hunch. Um, and it was a really nasty moment. And it was a mother versus childless woman moment. And did I hold the door? Did I let the door slam on purpose? I don't know. Subconsciously, maybe. It's weird, isn't it? Because uh, because obviously I, I spent ages trying to have children. I did lots of IVF and all that stuff. And I remember the sort of the fetishi fetishization of pregnancy and children and babies mm. something that i found deeply uh difficult to deal with when i really? when i when i wasn't uh when i you know was trying to have a baby and i wondered mm. if that was the similar sort of anger that you probably felt then it's, it wasn't even anger it's just an, an impatience i mean listen I, I i get it children are the children i i believe the children are our future i don't believe it i know they are <laughs> I don't need to write a song to know that. Um, I get it. And and I also have nieces and nephews. I have a dog. I know how much you love things that are yours. But something about the fetishization of children is really, really annoying. I think it's because you see the, uh, you, you see your friends disappear into motherhood. I write about this in the book as well. You see them disappear into motherhood and they almost have no time for you at all. And you can feel a bit abandoned, which sounds really babyish. Um, and it, it's really fucking dreary. It's really, really dull. And I would put you in the class of women who isn't, dull, has, doesn't. I'm sure you love your children as much as any other mother, but you're not one of those women that goes on and on about their kids. And a lot of my friends aren't, but some are, and I don't see them that much anymore. Yeah, I can see. I can see that it's very, very boring. And for people talk about how ex how exciting it is that Chloe has managed to do something. Um, you know, and, it, it, and also there's, there's something quite, I think what I see in, obviously I know loads and loads of parents now, I'm 50 years old, almost all of my friends are parents. So I've, I've been able to make quite a kind of objective study of them. And the people that don't fetishize children tend to have reasonably full lives and, a, and got confidence. But I think when people really fetishize their children, 
okay, first kids, everybody's allowed to go a bit nutty, aren't they? But I think people who really fetishize their children, there's, there's something missing inside them. I see it in a lot of divorced dads. I've dated quite a few divorced dads who project like neurotic, protective, obsessive love into their kids, which you can just see is a disaster waiting to happen. And it's fucking annoying to be around as well. Um, but hey, it's really easy to stand on the sidelines and judge parenthood, but I've heard it's the hardest game in the world. <laughs> Particularly now during lockdown. Anyway, the book is the book is full of 100% my honest feelings about all of that stuff. I, I know I, it is. It's, I didn't it's, expect to come out of this being liked. Um, but you, but it's done. I mean, the writing. How much? How much writing and rewriting did you do? Because because the prose in it is is brilliant and but also I mean it's almost like you're flaying yourself alive while you're doing it it's sort of it's I mean really you dug very deep through it in it um, which well, is I, think it works well I I had this it took me a long time to get into the book as I sort of mentioned earlier and then I realized that it would only work if I told the truth that there is no there is I mean I'm not saying this is great literature but if I thought about books that I loved they were the rawest, rawest expression of real, real fucking truth. Sorry, I keep swearing. I don't know why. Um, I think I'm on a sort of late night 70s French art show. I'll start smoking in a minute. Um, and, I was, and I was like, the, what frightens you the most? What frightens you the most? And that's what you have to write about. So all the things that I wanted to write about and I wanted to present about myself, I shouldn't have done. I don't do that because that would be a shit book. Um, so once I'd written that really difficult first chapter, um, the book, I mean, you know, you've written loads of books. It, it's like any, I've, I've made a film as well, and it, it's like any passion project. Once it gets going, it takes on a life of its own, and it's like pushing a rock down a hill. It's, it hits bumps and stuff, and might settle in a hole for a while, but on the, it, it's got its own volition, and it's its own entity. Um, but it took me three years to get to that point where I'd written that first chapter because I just kept looking at it going, oh, who cares? Boring. It all felt quite forced. But um, my brother said to me, my brother's a filmmaker, and he said to me, well, I remember talking to him about that. And he goes, oh, well, it's process, isn't it? And I was like, oh, my God, I can't use a word like process. That's the sort of thing that artists say and people who write books and I was like well shit you are trying to write a book I mean it's not a straightforward thing where you sit down and go you know hello da, 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 I'm writing a book I'm starting at 6 a.m this morning and I'm sure there are lots of successful writers like that there is a bit of time just dithering around poking about getting things wrong procrastinating and then suddenly some something organic forms in that you manage to share it with the keyboard which shares it with yeah but you have sort of brilliantly sort of eviscerated quite a lot of that Notting Hill bubble, which... Yeah, uh, yeah, most of them are my really good friends. Well, that was what I wanted to ask you. How can... How, did you disguise people? Did you... Did you... Or, or are they still talking to you? So there's one person who's never going to speak to me again. Uh, which was probably a good thing, because he was quite a bad influence in my life. <laughs> although very 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 few people have spotted who it is um there are other people who are hurt properly hurt but with whom we have just an impasse and it's fine i'm just a kind of it's fine um there are a couple of people who get who were initially upset and then got it um and there are people who have don't recognise themselves. Well, that's the, to me that's always the interesting one yeah. because because your truth, your observation, your point of view is often very different from somebody else's, and the, you should never underestimate the vanity of some people. So some people will see themselves in a in a thing in a situation where you 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 couldn't even possibly imagine that they put two and two together, uh, and other people just don't see themselves at all. So. There's a character in the book called, so I, I fictionalized almost everybody because I wanted to tell the truth. 
and I also wanted to walk the truth so it fitted well into a story. So fundamentally it's all true, but certain things have been condensed and certain characters are amalgamed because I needed to get across a certain, a certain number of ideas about certain types of people I knew. Um, so it is, to, it is in some ways quite fictionalized. Um, it's all true, but it, it's like I said to someone the other day that I might try a novel next time because when you, with fiction, you can really tell the truth. Um, and I did have, I did have to pull punches, definitely. Um, I completely lost my train of thought. How, how did your right. boyfriend cope with being sort of... Oh yeah, so there's a character in the book called Melanie Oxbridge and she represents every girls school educated upper middle class uh educationally hothouse oxbridge graduate that i have encountered in my life in the media and there are fucking loads of them you know my sister-in-law is one she's a very successful girl um i would include you in that group even though i know you went to bristol <laughs> because that's my that you know that's kind of my issues um that's my inferiority complex. That's my chip on my shoulder. It's not necessarily a slight at, at them. It's the way I perceive these people. And that again was, was about being honest. And like one of that, that, I was like, what am I ashamed of? I'm ashamed of not being one of those women. I'm also ashamed of all the debt I'm in. I've written about that. You know, that was harder than writing about the drugs actually. Um, but yeah, so there's a character called Mel Melanie Oxbridge and she's based on a lot of different people but specifically one, one writer on a broadsheet, one female writer on a broadsheet. But it's interesting, people are obsessed by who she is. And Rachel Johnson came up to me in the aforementioned coffee plant. And she, she's never spoken to me before. We live very near each other. We both like dogs. Um, and she came up, she went, loved your book. I'm Melanie Oxbridge, aren't I? I was like, well, you're not, because, you know, I've never spoken to you before, but she was like, I so want to be her. It is me. But at least Rachel had the insight to see herself as a privileged, kind of sexy blue stocking with all the privilege of being a Johnson. And, but other people were, were like, who might have been Melanie Oxbridge's were very, yeah, very upset and offended. And the actual person it's based on, she's pretty, pretty pissed off about it, I've heard. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. <laughs> I wish she hadn't found out because, like, really, I, she's fine. She's an all right person, but <laughs> it's just about me skewering those, all those. In a way, it was a quite cathartic being awful about people that I've been jealous of or threatened by. Was it, the minute you actually express this stuff, all their power goes away. Yeah, well, so it's yeah, it's in a voodoo doll. Exactly. It's like popping a balloon. It's the same yeah. thing. Exactly. The education balloon. <laughs> so then, what? So half what? So the book changes uh, when when you're when Wolfie goes missing. Yeah. And um, and then extraordinary. You're about the only person I've ever heard of who's had a sort of positive Twitter experience. The idea that that you created this uh, on Twitter. Tell me what happened. So, I the the night Wolfie went missing. Uh. I made a poster and I posted it on Twitter. And I think the words I wrote were, um, my beautiful dog has run away, please God. And please Twitter and God, if you're out there, help me find him. And I, have put, and I posted the most gorgeous photograph of Wolfie bathed in dawn sunlight, just looking like this golden, beautiful beast. And I think there were two reasons why people picked up on it. I think. Firstly, and mostly, it was because Jeremy Clarkson retweeted it overnight. And I woke up to like 3,000 retweets. Incredible. I mean, if Jeremy hadn't done that, um, I'm making it sound like he's my friend. He's not my friend. <laughs> if Jeremy hadn't retweeted that tweet, you know, maybe I would have 100 retweets from Lucky, 50, 10, 5. But then I think the, the other thing that it triggered in people, because if you look there's a lot of lost dog tweets but they're all the posters are a bit muddled um there's no real impassioned clar there's no clarity of the emotional experience of the loss and i just think 
I don't feel like I've made much money as a journalist. I don't feel like it's taken me that many places. But I think it was all, all everything I'd learned in the media over 30 years all led up to creating the perfect lost dog poster. And I had the minimum of words, um, the minimum of words. But I think with those words as a writer, I was able to express something very, very emotional. And I think people saw it as the pilot of a soap opera on Twitter. And but it was, I mean, it went. People mad. really got into it. Oh, I remember, I remember being told that your dog had been found and bursting into tears. It no. Was up, yes, the update of where's Wolfie? I mean, was it because he's called Wolfie and he's the looks like clotted cream? I mean, it was like it was a proper story, and I think because you kept people updated as well, everyone got involved. Yeah, I think I think for me, you'll understand this as a writer. The uh, when you are just commute, when you are just communicating your immediate thoughts to the page, you know, you and I both came up through like writing loads of first person pieces, writing about all, you know, not writing about our lives, particularly in the nineties. And I think when you are writing about your life and you and you can communicate what's inside you. People may look down on that as a form of journalism, but people love reading it. They love reading it. And actually, in the 90s, we were the kind of, we were the beginnings of reality TV, the whole first person columns and writing about your life. And, um, and it came very naturally to me. And I was also desperate. I was desperate. I was in so much pain. And I think when I think about people I know who've just lost a parent or, God forbid something, a child or, or, or something that's really, really important to them, they, they do talk and they have no filter. And it was an outlet for me. And, and it made me realize how much social media is an outlet for people who are in pain. And there was an interesting, one of the women that really supported me on Twitter was her uh, tag was at, at Beautiful Mumsy. And I started to dig into who these people who were really, really supporting me. So Beautiful Mumsy would take my original poster and retweet it to, to famous people who would go on and retweet it. She was brilliant. I mean, I, didn't, I had no idea who she was. So I started digging into who these people were and Beautiful Mumsy, her bio on Twitter was that she was the proud mom of a daughter who died of, I think, a colorectal cancer. And there she was paying forward her pain in the form of love and support. And she does things like, you know, she still does it. You know, if people are trying to raise money for a charity or if they're, she was always there with a retweet. And actually I did a book tour in earlier this year for the paperback release. And uh, she came along to one of my readings, the reading in Glasgow, and I met her. And um, it was really, it was kind of emotional actually, because I just thought, I know you've suffered, you've really suffered. And the support you gave me on Twitter is because you do not know what to do with the pain of losing your daughter. And I think when you're in a lot of pain and you don't know what to do with it, Twitter's maybe a place that it could go to. So I think people really picked up on my ability to express the emotion. And I did keep people updated. And it was real time as well, because I would just get, I'd get a tip from someone and then I'd just jump in the car and go to the place. And we did get really, really great tips from Twitter. And, but, and didn't, it, you it up, amazing. didn't you end up with um, um, ITV, or was it Sky News? When Sky, the dog Kay was Burley. Found? Kay Burley. So Kay Burley loves dogs. And she had retweeted it a few times, along with Jeremy Corbyn. Um, Dave Cameron didn't didn't retweet, sadly. Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn did. Um, he obviously hates dogs, like he hates Europe. Um, oh, Ronnie Wood, Jane Fallon, Ricky Gervais, oh, some really interesting people retweeted us. Um, where am I going? Look, I'm just name dropping now. <laughs> um, no, so, as in you ended up being on the news. Oh yeah, so Kay Burley was one of the people <coughs> who retweeted us. And, um, I think she realised, she's a proper news hound, isn't she? She realised it was really viral and really people were really into it. And it's the ultimate and finally, isn't it? 
it's like a kitten. I remember watching Fox News once and seeing that they actually, Fox News actually did a story about a kitten up a tree in somewhere in California, in somewhere in LA. And I was like, oh my word, really? Um, but uh, yeah, they did an Anne finally, when Wolfie was found, they did an Anne finally, which was um, seven or nine minutes long. Amazing, amazing. And so when you, when you were doing, did, did you, did you, did you, did you write the whole book before you sold it? Or did you, did you sell it? Uh, God, no, I don't write for no money. Possible to get this stuff done. I, I need a word rate. Um, I wrote, in the end, my, my agent rang, like, a, rung three chapters out of me. Took a while, but he rung three chapters out of me. And then we... I'm going to say, he always says, don't ever talk about this, but I'm going to say it was widely rejected. People were just going, who cares about some middle-aged drug addict journalist and her bloody lost dog? And it was a hard sell, but then the very, very clever people at Penguin Random House, at Ebury, um, a, very, a young editor at Ebury liked it, but I had to write another chapter so, you know, I had to sell my book. It wasn't what, I mean, I would have loved to have been one of those people that like Kate Spicer, whose first book sold for a million pounds on, on a pitch written on the back of, a, of, a, of an envelope. But no, I had to really, yeah, had to. But then what, once I'd done, what was great about that is I did a really, really thorough outline. I uh, broke down every chapter. Uh, you've got four chapters, so I had three chapters from the top of the book and a chapter at the end of the book. They just wanted to see how the lost dog bit would actually feel and I think it does feel very different to the first because the first part of the book was really fun to write uh the second part of the book was a, it was wasn't that fun reliving the whole thing so no but and what it was amazing it, it is you get to see the sort of sort of I, I liked the, the nocturnal London bits with the, the night joggers and all these extraordinary characters incredible eccentrics like, yeah incredible eccentrics and also I loved going back to the, the, the second half of the book. I didn't particularly enjoy writing, but I loved going back to some of the characters that I met because I really loved the cultural diversity of London. And when I was writing this, it was in the backdrop to the whole, you know, Brexit campaign. And, and, and there was a sense that this country had the potential to be really quite racist. And then I was thinking about these incredible moments I had with people who barely spoke English, but bonding with them over our love of dogs. And, and, and there's this one character called Marwan, who I never really, I never worked out where he came from, but I, I think North Africa, probably like Algeria or somewhere like that. And uh, his English was terrible. Uh, his, kids, his kids' English was pure North North. London but he obviously lived here a long time and and I and he he provided me with an incredible lead his, it turned out his daughter had seen my dog and and I and I have this kind of brief but very important relationship with this with this immigrant who barely speaks English and like he's a, he's a human being and he's a, I, I really loved digging into the so the first part of the book is about my social group, my privileged media Notting Hill crowd. Um, and the second part of the book is about all the other types of people you find in London. And um, I love all of that. It's, know, it's, like a hom it's an homage to London in a weird way, isn't it? I mean, it's... It's, it's definitely a, a love story to, to the real Notting Hill. Yeah. The real dubby, grubby Notting Hill. But yeah, all, London is, is an all human life thing. And it was the hunt for Wolfie forced me because I, initially when I started hunting for him, I only go up to people who look like me. I go up to white middle class ladies and just middle class dog owners generally. It's not necessarily a colour thing, but uh, and, and that's what I do for the first day or two. And then I'm like, oh, hang on a minute. No, that's a very small, that's a percentage of small percentage of London. You've got to go out to everybody and ask them, have you seen my dog? And that's when London really like explodes in front of me. And I'm talking to like ultra, ultra conservative Muslim women. Um, 
you know, people that barely speak English, people who are complete. I mean, I got to a point where I was getting a bit insane. I was like sitting down and chatting to street drunks in Finsbury Park, old wrecked street drunks. And my friend Kim, who came and did a hunt with me a couple of times, had to come over and just touch my arm and go, babe, I'm not sure he's going to be able to help. But I think I realised you don't want to be talking to your own type. They, 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 if they found a lost dog, they went straight down to the vets. I found a dog. <laughs> just got to get out to everybody. And, um, and actually, I look back on those weeks now as, as a kind of privilege, actually. Humbling, a humbling privilege to see how other people live and, and to see just the absolute universal kindness. I met so little cruelty. There was a little bit on the internet, a little bit of, um, oh, I've seen your dog in a kebab and I had a few really horrible hoax calls, but broadly the majority of everybody online and offline and in real life were, were wonderful people. And I hope that that's a true representation of the world we live in. And Wolfie was obviously found because we've just seen him. And- uh... Oh, it's still, a, it's still worth reading it though. Oh, obviously. No, that, it's, it's not really about a dog. It was found, so we don't need to deal with that book. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was just about to say, I'm just, I, can you just describe the moment? Wasn't he found in a, with a, a garage mechanic? Oh, of course. Oh, I don't want to give the whole thing away, but he was found in a, he was found in a, in a body shop for really, really, really expensive cars. I mean, if it does get made into a film, that scene is going to be amazing. Um, and we'd, we'd followed up so many um, bad leads and whatnot, and we couldn't quite believe that these people actually had him. And um, they did. And I remember thinking as we moved towards the place where he was, I couldn't see him, but I was moving towards the place and I could see a lot of people standing around. I knew, I couldn't believe it until I saw him, but I knew I was entering into a moment that I would remember for the whole of my life. And I remember the energy, the vibration of the, of the, the atmosphere was, it was so intense. It was so intense. And I almost, I did, like I didn't run. I walked, I walked, even though I could have started running and seen him there, but I walked, it was almost like I was, it wasn't like this, but it was almost like I was savoring a moment. I, 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 I wasn't thinking in any way other than everything was sort of autonomic or whatever the word is. I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking like a human. I was thinking like an animal, but I moved really, really, really slowly. And then when I turned the corner and I saw him, it was, ugh, it was just the most, oh, I just, I just don't, understand how an animal and a human can be so tightly bonded and the truth is most an awful lot of people are like that with their dogs some more than others but man I love that dog so much so it was it was so amazing to find him and the and the kind of surges of the surge through my body my boyfriend's body the dog we were all just we were all like a meter above the ground vibrating on weird happiness hormones. It was amazing. It sounds, it sounds absolutely incredible. Almost <laughs> worth losing a dog for it. No, I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> and are you, uh, are, you, uh, are you going to write another follow-up, another one? Have you been... Well, um, I did actually do a, a, quite an elaborate book proposal um, that... <laughs> That I showed to my agent and he was like that is mental you need to have a bit of a think about it so I'm kind of in I process I guess I'm in process process mode I'm just trying to get the next thing right but yeah there's definitely something I really 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 need to write about well I can't wait for one to read it because the, the lost dog was an absolute triumph Kate Spicer thank you so much for uh, talking to us it's been brilliant thanks for having me